If you are an enthusiast of any type and you don't know what these are, you are given a free pass because most people don't, don't know what these are. They are K-cars specific to Japan. And here I am in the US driving one. The K car is the KEI cars. They were first introduced right after World War II and they were introduced for people that were used to having bicycles and they don't really belong here and I don't really belong in them. I mean, I like small cars, but this is, this is truly absurd. Everything in these K cars is two thirds normal sized. Of course, I'm right hand drive, everything is reversed. So uh, blinkers are over here, wipers are over here. You gotta remember that every time you drive this. These are the kind of cars that we wanted to experience because they don't exist in America. This recipe, this kind of thinking does not exist here. Thanks to our friends at Soto Moto in Seattle, they have given us two K cars to go have fun with and cruise around the city in. Because why not? You're watching Everyday Driver. We make a TV show, podcast, and YouTube channels dedicated to great cars, driving adventures, and helping you find a car you'll love. Subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss a thing. K cars were originally designed after World War II to help get a culture that was obsessed with bicycles and motorcycles into a more expensive automobile of the car. They have to be less than 11 feet long, they have to be less than five feet wide, and no more than 660 cc's, so three quarters of a liter of engine size. Up until modern time, these cars have accounted for 30 to 40% of the entire Japanese car market. They are specific because they meet a certain insurance and tax regulation to lower the cost. So think lower cost everything and still fun to drive. The car I'm driving is a Suzuki Cappuccino and it is one of three sporty K cars known as the ABCs of K cars, the Mazda AutoZam, the AZ1, the Honda Beat, and the Suzuki Cappuccino. This is designed for city life. It's designed for Tokyo. It's designed for Japan. And honestly, this car doesn't get too many looks. It's, unless it, people are looking for the size, it doesn't really get a, wow, what is that? Besides being right-hand drive, this car feels fairly normal. You can fit in it better than the AZ1, which isn't really saying a lot, but these are still tiny cars. It looks a little bit odd in its proportions, but they've packaged a lot of really usable stuff here, including an actual usable trunk. However, what's super cool about this car is the top. It's a three panel top. There's this center T top section here. And then these two panels unlatch with luggage latches and they lift right out. You can actually take just the center parts out and make a target. You can make a T top or you can make a full convertible all with just these pieces. Now, if you take them off and need to store them somewhere, there goes your trunk. When people see an interesting small car, or an interesting any car, they want the instrument panel and the steering wheel to give it away, to tell them some kind of information about what the character of the car is like. The cappuccino does not do that. These gauges look like something out of the Honda lineup. All of your HVAC controls and your stereo, they're in normal horizontal positions here. It seems like a normal car just slightly scaled down. It's almost like an optical illusion in here. The other thing about these cappuccinos is they're cheap. You can get one for five to seven grand. We know a guy that listens to the podcast that actually drives one for autocross. It's just his autocross toy. I imagine that's crazy fun, except I hope he's short. I'm in the AutoZam AZ1. It is the traditional K car. It's the one that you've probably seen and gone, what is that? Because it's got gold wing doors. Only about 3000 of these AutoZams were made, but the cappuccino is practically mass market by comparison with something like 30,000 made. People break their necks looking at this thing. It's kind of funny. They want to know what it is. And also with the AutoZam, they're wondering, is this an electric car? Is this some sort of new thing? Everything in here is shrunk down around you. Everything you know about cars. But what's so funny is the switch gear, the mirror is the same size as Miata's. I mean, well, there's the, your Miata door handle. It's the same size, it is the same part. It's very strange, it's like a cartoon drawing of a car is what this is. 
the interiors of all these K cars are kind of deceptively simple. The air conditioning actually works. The gauges are really clear, but there's no frills about this at all. It's hard, basic plastic, but there is a stereo. There's good HVAC controls. There's everything you need to drive, but there's absolutely no frills, except of course, in the AZ-1, you do get gullwing doors. I feel like the designers arrived at the doors and the layout by sketching rather than thinking packaging first. I've got an inch here. I don't know how Todd fits, but I think, yeah, he's gonna be a little bit taller than me in the driver's seat. I had to, had to kind of hunker and make sure that the glass cleared my head. Now, now I can sit up. You can see I can still touch if I want to. I desperately want a smaller steering wheel. An inch or so smaller steering wheel would allow me to actually not hit my leg constantly. I'm gonna wear out my pants where the left side of this wheel is constantly rubbing. I'm just too big for the car. Now I have just enough headroom. I'm, I mean, just barely enough. The K car rules are pretty strict. They can be no more than 660 cc's. In fact, they couldn't be 660 till 1990. Before that, they were 550. If you take a one liter bottle of water and you pour out a third of it, that's the capacity of this engine. The cool thing about the cappuccino and about this engine, on both cars as a matter of fact, is that it's turbocharged. It is a three cylinder, 657 cc engine and it's got about well people say between 60 and 70 horsepower and you think well that's not very much until you hit the green light when the turbocharger comes on between four and six the turbo is just on fire it's great on the freeway in a k car sure this is gonna go well well okay it's not fast but it it, it moves it, it scampers can we go with scamper scamper seems to work it's a three cylinder and it doesn't exactly have the most pleasing rev. It's, it's pretty rough. It's like it farts. Every cycle when you're sitting still and just idling, it's just going through its motions and it's very odd. I love when this tiny little engine gets up on boost. It's suddenly angry, tiny, but angry. In spite of this car's diminutive size, they actually figured out a way to make this tiny engine sit front mid-mounted, so the balance is still great. They later went to an upgraded version of this engine that appeared in a snowmobile making double the horsepower than it does in this car. It's so funny driving these cars and getting reactions from people because they think by the size it means electric. Whereas in Japan, when they were conceived, they were really just for fun and to meet the tax and insurance regulations. These tiny K cars are not fast from a stop. But you get them rolling, you get in the mid part of the RPM and they'll probably surprise you. Turbo. Everything's better with a turbo. I mean, that's really a truth of life, isn't it? The transmissions on both these cars are mm, finicky and they work, they work. I just have to remember to let the transmission work its way to third. I keep trying to force it. I, I'm missing the gear completely. You can see I'm crammed in here. I'm at, my knee is hitting the steering wheel and my hand all of the time. This is the clutch foot still. The clutch is spring-loaded. It either has off or you press it and it completely collapses. There's no real like refining catch point here. It's either on or off. So I'm having to struggle with that while the fact I can't really move my left leg. It feels like a paperclip and not the small paperclips. It feels like a binder clip. It releases that quickly when you let pressure off and you've, you can only modulate it by putting your heel down on the floor and using the heel as the fulcrum and using your foot like this. It's lots of parts, it's lots of finicky things. Although it does feel like you can beat on it. Hey, a downshift without killing anything, including my leg. I'm getting slightly better at this. The engine on this car, even though it's the same as the cappuccino, feels different and it sounds completely different. Well, of course, length, header length, exhaust length, 
that's really all it is, but it feels like it's tuned to be a little bit snortier in the cappuccino. It's almost like the cappuccino looks so plain and boring that it's gotta make up for something to be kind of irreverent. Whereas this car just seems like I'm an enthusiast, I don't wanna spend a lot of money, but I'm still aspiring to supercars. It's far lighter up front. It's about a 44% weight distribution up front. But the engine is actually kind of right sitting over the rear axle itself. For any city work, this is plenty powerful, but if you actually thought about, is this quick? Of course it's not. It's zero to 60 in the better part of 10 seconds. Up here in the mid-rev band, I mean, it goes to 9,000 RPM. Above 6,000, you put your foot in it, it's gonna dance away because there's no weight here. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Covercraft. Use the code EVERYDAY for 10% off your order. This encourages really nimble, fun, sporty, snake-like driving. <laughs> Get around. Yes, Prii stopping right in the street. Welcome to downtown. That's what this car is built for, to just weave around everything. People being stupid. You can just be nimble, super nimble, and get around everybody. Most of the time, the cappuccino feels like an 80% scale Mazda Miata. Now, if you think the Miata is small, you'd have to recalibrate for this car because this is almost a thousand pounds lighter than the current gen Mazda Miata. A thousand pounds. We'll call it 1,600 pounds, but there's not the kind of feedback that I'm used to in small cars. The wheels just steer without giving you anything. There's not a lot of character to the car other than it's small. The amazing thing about these K cars is how many things they get right while being tiny. I mean, many full-size cars can't figure out good steering feel and rear-wheel drive. These, because of their packaging, they don't have power steering at all. The light weight, the rear-wheel drive, this is proper dynamics done at three-quarter scale. I do like it because it's small, and honestly, it's easy to drive. For us Americans, we've just got to remind ourselves to drive differently when you're in a right-hand drive car. Blinkers are on the right side, Todd. Blinkers are on the right side. Your right-hand drive here, but you can almost put yourself in the left-hand driving position in the lane and still fit. Look at how huge he is. Look, I'm gonna get crushed. <laughs> Of course, there's no airbag. Also, you are involved with the crumple zone. The steering ratio on the AZ-1 is far quicker on this car than the Cappuccino. It is really direct and it brings this car to life. And I'm playing games with debris and pedestrians and all the stuff in the road. I have to admit, when you think city commuter car, you should think small little car. Granted, this entire city is filled with Range Rovers and CUVs and SUVs. I feel like I'm driving a bug. It's work driving this car, but it's fun work. <laughs> There's a reason that these cars were never invented for this market. There's a reason that not every car is a world car and it appeals to every market and every situation. This proves it. It was built for a specific market and to experience it here, it's still grading, it's still very odd, but that's what's so cool about it. You're trying to put this market that was conceived, the taxes, the insurance, and the size of the country that Japan is, and we're shoehorning them onto what is the American experience. Even the cities that are here are huge and still oversized for these K cars. Even though these are designed to be inexpensive, they just made decisions about what the car should be, and if it doesn't need anything over-engineered or fancier than it needs, then didn't add that. In general, nobody really notices this car. It blends into traffic. It's little, but it's not strange. But it's still rear-wheel drive and very fun. Hi, Escalade. Just, just come out in front of me. You're big. Nobody cares. That's fine. I'm tiny. 
I'm going to say that both of these cars, but especially the Cappuccino, are more fun than a bike. I'm going there because of the usefulness of this car, but they're still small enough, and you still get the same kinds of questions that bikers do when you stop at a gas station. Get that curious, what is that? What do you do with that? I like the outer space thinking here. I like the quirkiness of this design. I love, come on, gall wing doors are just cool no matter what they're on. This is a way to get a fairly affordable car that no one's probably ever seen. But one of the worst drawbacks to the AZ-1 would be the windshield. If you crack a windshield, $3,000, if you can find one. So if you decide to get one, you can get past the clutch and the mirrors flopping down every time you slam the door, and the endless questions that everybody has for you and wondering what it is and if it's some sort of cool, super electric car from the future, you know something that everybody else doesn't. While driving these, I don't think we ever asked the question of are we having fun? Because they're crazy fun to drive. But that never I really did, came up. Actually. I did always ask, should you really own one of these? I know people have as much passion and love for JDM cars, well, these cars, as I have for European cars and sure. Porsches. But they yeah. are the quirky cars that I think is striking sure. a chord. Absolutely. For me, I think it's gonna be a fourth, maybe fifth car. I'm pushing it out there even more because there's so many cars I keep thinking of that I want. For those of you with five car garages, you know, <laughs> well, you solved your fifth car problem. That, that is the problem. The big, the big takeaway for me was actually just size. I think if you're five, yeah. 10 and under, these are real consideration for a, for a fun car. Yeah. But above that, honestly, I'm just too big to thoroughly enjoy it, even though I do enjoy it. And I have to say, Driving the AZ-1 is like driving a spaceship. It's really cool. Well, you get all the benefits of supercar ownership without the price. $14,500 with Lamborghini doors and all the Lamborghini attention Absolutely, that comes with this car. Yeah, yeah. But I think of the actual driver's cars, it's the Cappuccino that's actually easier and more fun to drive. It's far easier to drive. It's awesome in that regard. It is far easier to drive. That is far more fun to figure out and be seen in. And, and to own. It is the ego stroking car for a lot less money. All the supercar ownership, none of the supercar hassles, except for tires, oil changes, right service, hand drive. right hand drive, windshields, and uh, <laughs> where are you gonna put it in your fifth car garage? I would like to have this car, I would like to have actually both these cars just to own them and experience them, but you've gotta commit, just like you do to any car, you've got to commit to them to be able to own them and have the infrastructure and tires and all that kind of stuff. But I think this kind of car is especially worth it because of the low cost. The fun factor here, just zooming around in this thing, you're gonna meet new friends, you're gonna have a lot of fun driving this thing, and it parks anywhere. If you're buying a K car for fun, but you're used to cars being normal, the Cappuccino's your choice. If you're buying a K car for fun and you want it to be a spaceship, go shop the AutoZam. I think this car is actually cooler because you don't see them. It looks like you went to effort to choose this car, even though these from Sotomoto, they're about 14,000. The really nice ones go up to 22. This one's 14.5. And I think it's worth it. This feels like it's related to absolutely nothing. It's like a 1980s idea for what a spaceship should be. I wish I fit better, because then I'd really want one. Okay, legs are starting to get cramped here. I don't think I want to spend too much more time in this car. 